Um, and our speaker this morning, or this evening, a little late for morning, isn't it? Uh, is Dr. Ch uh, Todd Janak. Uh, he is a husband, father, doctor of chiropractic with a special interest in serving children and adults with chronic or difficult health conditions through uh, a unique form of chiropractic known as upper cervical care. Uh, Todd received his doctorate degree from Cleveland Chiropractic College in Los Angeles. He has a BS degree in exercise and sports science from the University of Florida. Having um, spoken on stage both in America and Australia, Todd's passionate about educating and empowering families on where health comes from, how we lose it, and how to get it back and keep it. He loves teaching people how to get well so that they're less dependent um, on medication and capable of reaching their God-given uh, potential so that they can do all the things that they want to do in the villages. Dr. Ty. Thank you. Uh How's that? Better? Okay. I'm not used to the microphone. <laughs> well, um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be able to share with you guys. And um, I always like to acknowledge any audience we're at, especially on a weekday evening, because um, you can be doing anything. You know, here we are in the villages, there's probably 100 different activities and friends, and maybe just your favorite shows on. Uh, but you chose to be here to invest some time and some energy learning. So I hope I don't disappoint you um, that you leave, if nothing else, just with a few things that you can implement tonight or tomorrow morning that will make a difference in your health future, yeah? Um, and I have my beautiful wife and daughters here helping. They're the ones handing out, handing things out for you. Thank you, ladies. Um, yeah, beautiful daughters. Th thank you very much. <laughs> so just a little housekeeping. When you leave tonight, We'll have some hand, some takeaways for you, okay? So make sure you grab the blue packet. And then also you probably would have been handed this health and wellness survey. Don't worry, we're not gonna, you know, hound you or do anything terrible with it. We're just collecting demographic data and we like to see what are the things that trend over time in certain demographics. So if you don't wanna fill it out, you don't have to. Uh, but if you wouldn't mind, just take a minute at your leader and fill that out. And so we're getting used to the microphone. Maybe the lights will go down. No, I can't see anything. <laughs> uh, all right. It's, uh, so you guys have been learning about nutrition of late. Yes, you've had other speakers come and talk about it. And you've probably been at least loosely or in some degree informed or hearing of nutrition over the years and decades now. Right? Okay, so has, has nutrition, have the, have the fads and what, what we thought was true changed over the years? Yeah. And do you think it'll change again? Yeah. Is there a problem with that? Yeah. yeah, it was like, well, last time they said this was good and now it's bad and eggs were good and now they're bad and now they're good again. You know, it's like, well, what do we do? Um, and I think a lot of people get at least initially interested in nutrition, um, you know, for health and fitness or weight loss. Uh, the first weight loss, weight watchers meeting was in 1964. Um, and what's happened to society since then? Have we gotten thinner? No, we got better. <laughs> exactly. Um, and that's not judged, not, you know, the things I'm going to talk about too are not coming from a place of being judgmental or critical. It's just kind of, you know, what's going on in society. We all want the same thing. We want to be happy. We want to be healthy. We want our families to have the same thing. So rather than teaching you or trying to say, hey, here's the latest fad or here's what science tells us today, <coughs> maybe different next year, I like to talk in terms of principles. And the principles can be both biblically based, they can be scientifically based, and they can be common sense based and things that you can apply. Because if you have foundational principles, then you can put anything that comes to your mind or an, an option, you have options, you always have options. Do I eat this or do I need eat that? Well, I don't know. Well, if you have foundational principles, you can put it through that filter and you'll have your answer. 
Like, I like the example if you're a Christian, you're like, well, is this something I should or shouldn't do? Well, what's your, what is your filter that you're going to go through? What's your compass? Well, I'm gonna, what does the Bible say? You know, you have a filter to which to make decisions by. So there's principles, foundational principles. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right? So let's just kind of bring it home here. Uh, by the way, how many of you would, would love to achieve an optimum level of health given the opportunity? Yeah, show of hands. <laughs> right? How many of you are there? You couldn't be 1% healthier. You're, you're at the pinnacle. Right, me neither, right? But that's kind of what we're always shooting for, is what's optimal for you. So uh, whether I'm speaking in the community or in my practice, our goal is always to help people reach their God-given health potential. So we teach in terms of principles, and if you, again, just understand the principles, you'll know what decisions to make. So we'll kind of bring it home here. This is a rhetorical question. Are you as healthy today as you were five years ago? Well, number one, you could say, well, how do I know to find health? You get nitpicky if you wanted, and that's actually a fair question. Well, how do I know what health is? Right? But just from your own knowledge or from what you would guesstimate, um, I get different answers. Most of the time I get a shaking head, like, like uh, or kind of a, I hope so. <laughs> you know? Um, and sometimes, depending on the crowd, I'll ask someone, someone will be like, yeah, I'm way healthier than I was five years ago. And I'll say, great, ma'am. Um, why do you feel that you're healthier? And the answer is inevitably that they made some lifestyle change. I quit smoking, I lost 50 pounds, I started exercising, et cetera and so forth. Never is the answer, you know, I'm on three new medications, so I'm pretty feeling like I'm doing better now. You guys with me? So always it's a lifestyle change. And then the follow-up question to this is, if your answer is, well, I don't know, or I don't think I am, if the answer is no, where will you be in another five if you keep doing what you've always been doing? Mm -hmm. The trend isn't good, right? So it's kind of to rattle your cage a little bit. All right? So I like this quote from Heraclitus. When health is absent, wisdom cannot reveal itself, art cannot be manifest, strength cannot be exerted, wealth is useless, and reason is powerless. So in other words, what is your health effect? Everything. And it doesn't just affect you, does it? It affects those around you. So as a husband and a father, if I lost my health in some ways, that can affect my wife and my kids. Yeah, as I can affect my ability to serve in my community and in my practice. Yes. And if it affects my kids, is that going to affect directly or directly their friends and classmates and things, right? Like it's a huge ripple effect. So, um, you know, I like to think of our health as our greatest earthly asset, right? Um, and it's easy to forget about. Things are good, we forget about it. We talk about the next holiday, or, or we used to talk about the next holiday. We're gonna travel, we're gonna buy a new RV, um, depending on stages of life, what you're looking for, right? If you're middle-aged, like, okay, we're gonna start planning for retirement, we've got a plan, let's get a financial planner, where do we invest, so I'm gonna have a plan to get A to B. Um, but our, our health and fitness can kind of take a back seat, because, you know, it's okay right now, I'm fine. Um, the last thing you want to do is neglect your greatest asset because it's very hard to get back, <laughs> right? And if you lose your health, well, that vacation is not going to happen, the RV trip ain't going to happen, et cetera, and so forth. Um, so let's keep going with that mindset. I like these folks from way back, evidently. Hippocrates, father of modern medicine, he said, let your food be your medicine and your medicine your food. That's pretty simple. Do you know that's what medicine used to be? Just go back 100 years. It wasn't pharmaceutical based like today. It was more like homeopathy, it was naturopathy, it was herbs, it was nutrition. Um, unfortunately, I found out that that doesn't make a lot of money. <laughs> so the model changed, right? We don't have time to get into it all. If you like your history buff, um, just look back to John D. Rockefeller, turn of the century, and modern medicine is a derivative of his business empire, which was petroleum. You put an aspirin on a spoon and light it up, it'll turn into a black bubbly tar. It's a petroleum based. So the whole pharmaceutical industry actually got started from that. But anyway, I digress because we will run out of time, but it is quite fascinating, uh, the history of it all. So our mission, or at least through my office, and the reason we're even here tonight, you know, um, obviously we're not home having a family dinner, we're here, and we choose to be here because we want to make an impact, but I know that we can save lives with information. I'll talk a little bit about it tonight. 
According to the literature, not according to me, according to the scientific literature, 90% of all chronic illness and death is due, are preventable. They're called diseases of lifestyle. So if that's true, I know I can save lives just with information, which begs the question, why aren't the doctors and the experts doing more educating? I mean, that is actually the literal definition of doctor. Doctor translates to teacher. So why don't we just teach people how to get well and stay well? And that's part of our mission, right? So here's what's going on every day in our country, right? This is as of 2016. 1,178,082 people will go to a general practitioner today. So how many people tomorrow? On average, 1.178 million people every day, right? And that's just the GPs. That's not the specialists or other doctors. These are in-office visits. And then this is how many uh, drugs are prescribed every day by community pharmacies as of 2020, 17,260,000. Today, how many tomorrow, right? So we say that, uh, how are we doing as a, as a country, as a society? Are we, we vibrantly healthy? So should we be? I mean, if this worked, what should we be? Should we be vibrantly healthy? Because we do more of this than any other industrialized country in the world, right? So you've probably seen some of these stats before. I realize I'm probably preaching to the choir a little bit, but maybe not. You know, this is what's going on. Is there a time and a place to go to a GP? Yeah. Is there a time and a place to take medication? Yeah. But the question is, when is the time and the place? And if you did things to grow and protect your health over time, the odds of you needing either of these would be much less. Does that make sense? And so again, that's not coming from a place of being judgy. It's just the reality. So. You know, I like to say that you can't drug your way out of a health problem that your lifestyle creates. I'll say that again. You cannot medicate your way out of a health problem that your lifestyle creates. And according to the literature, that's 90%. At least 90%. Right? So our current model is failing. This is non-controversial. I mean, it's in the literature. It's everywhere. Um, Obesity is up. Heart disease is up. Strokes up. Cancer up. It's all going up. Right? Our kids are getting sicker, right? ADD, autism, you know, we've got a few folks here that are over, over 40, <laughs> right? Look, when I was growing up, I went to primary school in the 80s. There was no ADD. Like, what, what was that? You know, asthma puffers? Maybe one kid in the whole school had one, and it was kind of a, what is that? But now it's, it's almost ubiquitous, right? Oh, you forgot yours? Here's mine. Yeah. <laughs> right? Let's say you got, you got autoimmune disorders. I mean, everything is through the roof. And the CDC, just this week, they just changed the parameters for milestones for developing children. In other words, like a milestone used to be crawling. They just got rid of that altogether. And then walking, the milestone was 12 months average, right? They just moved it to 18 months. Why would they move the goalpost? So they're moving all the, oh, that's just the new normal, right? Instead of going, well, wait a minute, why are our kids, grandkids, et cetera, why, are, why is their health so bad that we actually have to change the definition of normal rather than going, well, you know, let's figure out why this is happening, right? And I don't have time to get into it, but it's, it's pretty simple. <laughs> um, you know, we go real controversial there. But it's easy to go back to what we're doing is not working. It's just not working. Right? The prevailing model is failing. So we need to be willing to and open to explore other models, right? So here's some facts, the brutal facts over there. So this is, uh, this is the CDC in 2009. Uh, for the first time in history of man, children born after the year 2000 are not expected to live as long as their parents. That was already 20 years ago. And as I just mentioned, just this year, they just moved the milestones back because their kids are, aren't even developing properly, right? So I like to brag on my kids a little bit, but they're not, they're not necessarily special. Well, I think they are, but, you know, my daughters are 13 and 16, so 29 years between the two of them, and they've never had an antibiotic. They've never had a Tylenol. They've never had anything put in them except when my daughter broke her arm. Now, are they genetically gifted? No, we just live through these set of principles that I've started this talk with. 
And you can do that too, start tonight. And your kids and your grandkids can do the same thing. Right? Where you we gotta stop doing what we've been doing because it's not working so well. Right? So basically we got a sickness model, which is actually ten percent healthcare, ninety percent sick care, but the truth is that should be flipped. Right? We do need, you know, emergency medicine and you know, things happen. That should be about ten percent. Yeah, that's according to the literature, that's not according to me. But this is how it is now. I practiced in Australia for years, and we'd get referrals from the local GPs, and they'd, they'd come with this packet of paper, and they called it a managed care plan. So they had the, the GP, their specialist, you know, they'd send them to me, the chiropractor, and then they'd have these lists of doctors. And it's no joke, some of them had 14, 15 medications. Here's all their meds. And then at the top, it just called, they called it a disease management plan. It's not a get well plan, it's just, let's just manage your disease. And they're doing it with 15 medications. Well, no wonder they're sick. They're like, you know, I'm not the smartest guy. <laughs> but it seems kind of obvious, right? So we want to build health, and as you build health, you will need less and less medications and less and less doctors, right? Hopefully that makes sense. So there's three reasons we're in a health crisis. Number one is, We've been kind of conditioned to relieve ourselves of personal responsibility. We're not accountable. So I'm not saying you guys. You know, we out, out in society. We're kind of just taught that, well, you know, it's genetic anyway, or it's age-related, or my doctor's going to take care of it, or it's Medicare's responsibility, or it's Aetna's responsibility. But at the end of the day, who's, who's responsible for your health? You know, I can't work out for you. I can't eat for you. I can't think positive thoughts for you. It's all, all, all up to the choices you make. The second one is we have the wrong definition of health. So how do we kind of determine as human beings, how do we tend to determine, how do you know you're healthy today when you got up? How will you know you're healthy tomorrow? How do we all kind of just inherently do it? What's your gauge? Feel good. Feel good, thank you. I feel good. Well, could you be sick and feel good at the same time? Yeah. Yeah, what are the top disease killers? Heart disease. Can you feel your arteries clogging? Can you feel cancer growing? Right? By the time you feel these things, we're in trouble. Right? That's non-controversial. This is fact. And I could go on and on. You can't feel diabetes. You can't feel your pancreas shutting down. You know, you can't feel early stages of any disease. You feel it at the end, not at the beginning. So we got the wrong definition of health, which we'll talk a little bit about at the end. Um, and then the third one, I want to keep you in suspense at the end. So don't <laughs> let me forget. All right. So finish this for me. If you keep doing what you've been doing, been doing, you'll keep getting what you always got. Right? Simple. So there's three ways to improve your quality of life. Number one, increase your standards. In other words, what do you tolerate? Just, you know, your, your standards are your own. So is this okay with you? Is this okay with you? Or it's like, well, no, this is where, where we're supposed to be. That's my new standard, right? So you gotta, that's only, it's only something you can do is raise your own standards of what you'll accept. Number two is apply better strategies. So I'm hoping to give you some tonight, right? Some principles and strategies. And then number three, I spend a lot of time here. Your beliefs. Because at the end of the day, when you make a choice, what's behind your choice? Your beliefs, right? So it's like, uh, I'll give you an example. I'll try to pick something simple, like, um, let's say, uh, that's not a good example. <laughs> I'm thinking in my head, I got lots of examples for all around. But if you, for example, if you believe that age causes you to be sick or to break down, well, that's a very dangerous belief because guess what you're going to do? You're going to age. So by default, right, by self-fulfilling prophecy, where will your health go? And then you can go, see, told you. Even my doctor told me, well, you're 70 now, fam. Actually, it starts way before then, right? It's like, well, you're 40, downhill from there, good luck. Right? Am I wrong? That's kind of it. It's reinforced everywhere. Your doctors, your neighbors, your friends at church. You know, it's almost kind of a joke, but, you know, it's not really funny. <laughs> So we gotta change change those beliefs. And what are the beliefs? Well, here you go. 
bad luck or age. That's why I lost my house is bad luck. I mean, you could have a trauma. Maybe that's bad luck. You know, I fell off my bicycle and busted my knee. Well, you could say that that's bad luck. So trauma happens, right? We just talked about the age thing. What about bad germs? That's going. That's that's a big topic right now, right? The germs, right? And I hate to break it to you, germs have always been here. They will always be here, and they need to be here, right? You have more bacterial DNA than you have human DNA in your body. Really important germs. If all the germs died, we would die. Part of the ecosystem. Okay? In fact, if we were to swab all your hands right now, we're gonna find E. coli, we're gonna find staph, we're gonna find coronaviruses, we're gonna find um, you name it. <laughs> e. coli, like it's there. Right? It's always there. So germs are ambient in our environment. They're always there. Have you guys uh, anybody, you know, growing up in your house or, or maybe when you had your family at home, you got spouse, kids, right? And someone gets the flu. Raise your hand if that's ever happened in your house. Someone got the flu. Okay. <laughs> and when that happens, does everybody always get the flu? No. Or one or two people got the flu and huh, that's weird, they didn't even get it. Well, if it was a germ, wouldn't everybody have the flu? If the germ was responsible, they've all been exposed. They all touched the fridge handle and the sink handle and sit next to each other on the couch. If it was a germ, you would all be sick every time. Someone still got a cold? We all got a cold. Right? Both my kids, or one of my kids recently had a cold. I didn't get a cold. I'm putting my hands on people all day. They're coming in, sniffling. And, you know, I don't get sick every time they come in. So the point is, it's not the germ. It's the host. If you're in a weakened state, you are now a viable source for this to take hold. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. It'd be kind of like going to the trash dump. You know, you see a bunch of rats running around the trash dump, and you go, "Oh my gosh, look at all the trash those rats brought here!" <laughs> right. First, there's trash, then there's rats. You guys with me? So our body has to be actually in a weakened, deprived state for the germs to take hold. So the goal shouldn't be to kill all the germs. That's never gonna happen anyway. The goal is strengthen the host, right? Strengthen the host. It's your only hope, it's our only hope. And it's what's worked for millennia. Now, moving on, bad genes. Ooh, that one's been touted for decades. Well, you got the gene. Your dad had heart disease, your uncle had heart disease, your, your other uncle had heart disease. Yeah, and all of them sat on the couch and ate hamburgers and french fries for 40 years. That's not a gene problem, that's a lifestyle problem. And we tend to follow in lifestyles that our family did, right? Well, good enough for my dad, good enough for me. Right, my dad smoked his whole life and died of lung cancer. I'm probably gonna get it anyway myself, you know, it's genetic. All right, do you know there's a gene for a hangover? They discovered a hangover gene. When's the only time you experience a hangover when you drink too much. So is that a genetic problem? So that brings me to the next point. We all have genes and you can't have a propensity for a specific illness. Does that make sense? It's not a death sense. I mean, you might have a, a propensity within your genetic heritage for a particular issue. However, like the alcohol gene, it, it's, you have to turn them on. And genes turn on and off. It's called it, it's called, they're called epigenomes. It's a whole study of science. It's not new anymore, 20 or 30 years, it's called epigenetics. We do a whole talk on that, but it's fascinating. So you're turning on and off genes. So what turns on and off your genes? Your thoughts. Guess what happens when you're stressed, angry, resentful? Bad things. That'll make you sick by itself. And then you can throw on top of that a lifetime of poor dietary choices, sedentary, et cetera, and so forth, you're turning genes on and off, okay? So the, best, the simplest analogy I heard that I like, it's kind of like a loaded gun. Well, I have that gene, but it's tucked away in a drawer and a gun safe, and unless somebody pulls the trigger, it's pretty useless, right? So that's the idea behind the genes. You got these epigenomes. So according to literature, 99.6% of us have everything we need genetically to be healthy. That's a pretty good number. I think it's even more than that, 99.6. The other point four, you have like trisomy 21. That's Down syndrome every time. You guys pick up on a book, what I mean by true genetic issue. So, you know, it's kind of like 
your body is designed, you know, so I know we probably have different belief systems in here, so whether you're more, you know, science, evolution, I'm more faith-based, I'm a believer, so like we're created by design, but either way, it all lines up. So um, if you are designed, be it by God or evolution, to have certain requirements, you require water. What happens if you don't get enough water? What happens if you don't want you're dead. That's not an age problem. That's not a germ problem. That's not a genetic problem. That is, you don't have something you genetically require. Right? Now, what if um, you put something in there that your gene doesn't even recognize? Like, say, Coca-Cola. What is Coke? Does your genetic blueprint even know what it is? You're just slugging it down there. Your genes go, huh, we're supposed to digest and assimilate it. Do you know what it is, Bill? I don't know what this brown stuff is. Why is it so sweet? And why is it brown? <laughs> right? So anything that you put in that your genes don't recognize, that's called a poison. And when you poison yourself day in and day out for 30 years, that's not a genetic issue. It's not a germ issue. It's not an age issue. It's not a bad luck issue. It's poor choices whether you're aware of it or not. Right? I'm just picking on Coca-Cola. We could go on and on with picking topics. That doesn't mean you can't ever have a Coke. Right? You, so we'll get into some of that. I bet it hurt. I don't even know. I've got like I'm on like slide three. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me see if I can get my little video working here. Has anybody ever seen? Uh, how do I do this, Carl? Maybe it'll play. One of the best things terrorists could do is just build more fast food restaurants. Maybe add another pharmaceutical company, have a couple more infomercials, and encourage people to eat the way they eat now, and everybody's going to be dead in a hundred years, they can just walk right in, Donald, do that thing. One quarter of what you eat keeps you alive, and three quarters of what you eat keeps your doctor alive. Cancer rates going up, heart disease going up, stroke going up. We're poisoning ourselves with only processed Nutrient One of the major problems is what we do to the soil and the air and the water and everything we take in our food. We, for whatever reason, decided we're going to spray everything with every kind of pesticide, herbicide, larvicide, fungicide. We decided we're going to genetically modify things we don't know anything about. Can we actually improve what has already been created? And the answer is maybe, but not the way we've been doing it. If you want to know what's wrong, look down at the table. It's staring back at you. Think of it as chronic malnutrition, because that's what's going on. But if we think we're going to go to the doctor and get a pill for everything, we've missed the whole point. We have been taught our whole lives to be consumers of modern medicine, which is pharmaceutical medicine. Good health makes a lot of sense, but it doesn't make a lot of dollars. Now, the drug industry has every right to make money for the question by the rule. The ethics, I think, need to be very closely watched. What the pharmaceutical companies are doing may not necessarily be in the interest of our population. You can be as sincere as you can be sincerely wrong. Approximately 106,000 Americans die from pharmaceutical drugs each year. And these are people who took the medication as directed. There is a lot more turning to alternatives because what's being done before doesn't work. There is no magic bullet, but there is a lifestyle change that reverses serious chronic disease. It's cheap, it's simple, it's safe, it's effective. The solutions are here. They've always been here. Every single person in the world Every culture, every language, every person in the world knows it. You are what you eat. Food does matter. It's a choice. You don't have to be sick. Foodmatters.tv. Great movie. So there's a couple things there. One of the docs said people are dying from quiet malnutrition. Oh, micro, there we go. Quiet malnutrition, which is interesting. Because you guys just told me earlier that you know our body sizes over the decade keep, keep expanding, but so we have plenty of calories, but we're actually malnourished. 
And so we'll go back to the deficiency. So if you require water and you get none, you die. But what if you require, say, two liters a day and you're only getting one? So what happens? What? There's health and death, and then there's something in the middle. What do we call that? You can call it sickness or a state of, I call it dis-ease, right? Like with a hyphen. You're going the wrong way, right? Because you don't just you don't go to bed healthy Sunday and wake up sick on Monday. Right? You're doing this generally for years. So quiet malnutrition. So we got to make sure we're feeding our, our genetic blueprint what it requires and try to keep out the toxins that it doesn't require in terms of nutrition, right? So, you know, health and wellness kind of gets tossed around a little bit. It's almost like a throwaway word now. Like everything's wellness. Get your wellness pharmaceuticals. Okay, so Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary defines wellness as the quality or state of being in good health, especially as an actively sought goal. I like the last three words. Actively sought goal. Doesn't just happen. Arizona State University. Wellness is an active, lifelong process of becoming aware of choices and making decisions toward a more balanced and fulfilling life. Wellness involves choices about our lives and our lifestyles. National Wellness Institute. Wellness is an active process of becoming aware of and making choices towards a more successful existence. I like that. Who would like to have a successful existence? Right here. <laughs> right? So these definitions have three things in common. Number one, it's a process. Right? If you've lost your health, you're not going to get it back in a day. And if you're healthy, you're not going to lose your health in a day. Unless, you know, you get run over by a bus or something. But don't do that. Pay attention. Okay, number two, it's a lifelong process. When am I gonna start feeling better? How long did it take you to get to where you are now? Wow. Okay, hang in there. And number three, it's an active process. So it's not a responsibility you can delegate. You can't delegate it to your doctor, you can't delegate it to your spouse. It's us, right? It's your choices. So I like those definitions. It's good. It's a process, it's lifelong, and you have to be involved. So the fact that you guys are here tonight tells me you're already involved. You didn't have to be here, so I tip my hat to you. Well done. All right, would you feed your Who in here has doggies? Who likes their dogs? Who's dog people? Not, oh, come on. Some of you just aren't raising your hand. <laughs> dog people, right? So if you just fed your dog hot dog, dog, your dog hot dog, you fed your dog hot dog, soda, and potato chips, you fed him a steady diet of that, what would happen to them? They'd get sick. Well, what are we feeding our kids? Ooh, I wouldn't give that to my dog, but it's okay for you, Lily. Here you go. No, don't give those Doritos to the dog. Those are for you. Okay. Again, can you have an occasional hot dog? Yes, yeah, so I'll get to that, but... I don't think the, the issue in our country is we're not having an occasional hot dog, right? Every day is a Super Bowl. You got that. Right? So our nation, we eat 125 grams of protein on average a day. You only need 25 genetically. All right? 160 pounds of white sugar a year. That's a whole person worth of, uh, that's a big, I don't know, that's a, that's a pretty big bag, right? 68 gallons of soft drinks a year. I don't even drink one gallon a year, so that means someone else is drinking like 130 gallons. Yep. <laughs> uh, 88 pounds of aspartame. So if you're thinking, oh, but I drink diet soda. I, I could make a strong case that that's just as toxic, if not more toxic, than regular soda. So aspartame, when it's process in your body breaks down into wood alcohol and formaldehyde. Mmm, love me some formaldehyde. What's formaldehyde? Well, they, it's an embal they use an embalming fluid, but why it's bad for you, it's a carcinogen. Right? Cancer causes. And there's a whole bunch of other things there too, but we don't have time. So this is kind of neat. So we talked about genetics before. So you got genetics here, you've got your potential here, and then you've got your lifestyle, but your lifestyle is gonna, again, turn on and turn off your genes. It's gonna maximize your genetic potential, 
or minimize your genetic potential, right? So your lifestyle choices will determine the expression of your genetic blueprint. So I use the example of, let's say I get two, I get the best builder in Lake County. They build custom homes, beautiful homes. And I give him two different blueprints. They're both great blueprint. Sorry, blah, blah, blah. must be seven. I give him brilliant blueprints from the best architect in town. So best builder, best blueprint. But for house A, I get all the best grade A materials. Spare no expense. I got the best concrete, the best wood, the best roofing, the best everything, right? And then house B, awesome blueprint, amazing builder, but I buy all the cheapest stuff I can get. I go down to Pat Sales, I go down to Lowe's and they got a special on and I go, what's the cheapest stuff you got? Well, is there gonna be a difference in the two houses? Right, the blueprint's perfect. The builder knows what he's doing. We just have terrible materials. Same concept, you guys with me? Picking up what I'm putting down? All right. So you don't get sick, you do sick. Now this is maybe a little confrontational. You don't get sick, you do sick. I'll say it again, you don't get sick, you do sick. So, you know, I might get a cold or two a year, and I can tell you exactly why I got that cold. Because I neglected myself, I didn't get enough sleep, I allowed stress to get the better of me, I splurged in my diet one too many times and it was a perfect storm and my resistance went down and boom. So I don't blame the germ, I blame tough. Right? Because I didn't get sick, I did sick. You guys picking up on a foot down? Now what if you do sick, in other words you're doing sick choices, year over year for decades? Now we're getting into the realm of, you know, diabetes, heart disease, cancers, things like that, right? So the good news is even as they showed in that little video trailer, you can turn that stuff around, you can. In, in many cases, you can reverse it, books on it. You know, you can reverse heart disease. Dr. Dean Ornish, cardiovascular surgeon, right? He reversed his own heart disease. I mean, of course he was shamed by his own profession. How dare you say you can do that without open heart surgery and a lifetime of medication? Well, I did it. Here's the science. <laughs> All right. Your lifestyle choices will determine the expression of your genetic blueprint. You don't get sick, you do sick. Now sickness, this is really, if you want to simplify it, is a result of two things. You're either toxic with something and or deficient in something you genetically require. So the old time sailors, right? I like to use this example because most people have heard of it. They would sail for months on the seas. They wouldn't have any fresh produce. So what would they end up with? Iron is scurvy, right? They got scurvy, which is a deficiency of vitamin C, and it's lethal. So vitamin C is an it's, it's essential nutrient for the matrix of collagen. And collagen makes up all your connective tissues, like the walls of your arteries, your muscle, right? Collagen. So if you're vitamin C deficient, right? If you have scurvy, basically you're your collagen just starts to fall apart, like disintegrate. So your inside, you start internally bleeding. And you basically bleed from the inside out. It's pretty nasty. So that's if you get no vitamin C. Now what if you're quietly malnourished? Year over year, you're not totally deficient. You know, you're getting some vitamin C, but what if you need this much and you're only getting this much? Year over year, what's happening to your collagen matrix? Not so good, right? So that one of the places that we'll start to see it happen is the lining of your arteries. And if the lining of your arteries start to break down, right, and your body's pretty smart, it's gonna go, whoa, that's a really dangerous situation. We better do what? Patch it up. And what are we gonna patch it with? A cholesterol plaque. Is cholesterol the problem? Your arteries are falling apart from the inside out because you're quietly malnourished. And your body is trying to save you. Right? But we're not taught that. We're taught, well, you just need to take a drug. Take a lip tour, some sort of stat, right? 
So that's just one example. I could go on and on. Right, so toxicity, you want to be looking, where can I potentially be deficient? There are functional, functional medicine doctors, functional nutritionists, they can be testing to see what are you missing, right? And then toxicity, most of us know it's toxic. Maybe we're in denial a little bit. Well, how bad is like a pound of chocolate? I mean, come on. <laughs> I only have a six pack of diet soda every other day. Come on. <laughs> right, cheese. All right, so the number one nutrition rule. So now we're getting down to principles here. The further away a product is from its natural state, the way God made it, the more harmful it is for the body. Right? That's it. Pretty simple. Right? So you go, oh, why buy Cheerios? Because it says right on there, it's hard and healthy, right on the box, you know, whole grains. What tree did Cheerios grow on? How does the Cheerio become a Cheerio? It's 100% processed. But it's, you know, endorsed by the American Heart Association. So we just kind of buy into that, right? So in other words, stay away from processed foods. Quite simple. Jerk, just eat real food. So if it grows on a tree, you know, we could argue about meat all day long. Don't eat meat, eat meat. Uh, if you're vegetarian, vegan, that's cool. But if you're not, that's cool too. And I think everybody's a little bit different. Would that be fair to say? Yeah. You know, so they'll, they'll you know, one size fits all, I don't think applies to everybody, you know? Um, you gotta figure that out with yourself and your body will tell you. Boy, I eat meat and I feel like crap for two days. Maybe you need to tweak the diet. Or if I don't eat any meat, I feel like crap for a week. Maybe you need certain types of protein if you're only gonna get them. Are you guys with me? Right, but the main thing is eat clean, eat real food. So if you're gonna eat meat, it should be grass fed. It shouldn't be raised in a cage and injected with hormones. And are you gonna pay more for grass fed beef? Yes, but that is your health care. Medicare is not health care, that's sick care. Health care is, well, I gotta you know, pull out my wallet and actually invest in things that are gonna grow and protect my health, all right? Right. <laughs> Being healthy is really expensive. Sickness is really expensive, right? All right, farming. We talked about that. The video talked about it. So conventional farming, we're getting chemical fertilizers, soil depletion, herbicides. So the soils are depleted, right? So there's hardly any nutrients in them anyway. And the nutrients that they put back in to grow stuff is uh, artificial, right? NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Then they're spraying it with everything. And the reason they're so fungus and herbicide and, you know, you get weed, you get insects is because the plants themselves are deficient in nutrients. The host is weak, so in come the germs, just like with us. When the host is weak, in come the germs. So now we got to spray the crud out of it, and if it kills the bug, what's it doing to you when you eat it? No bueno, and you see the guys spraying it, right? They're wearing like astronaut suits, but it's okay for your kids to eat. That's fine. Don't want to just rinse it. So if you rinse it, okay. So let's say I got blueberries, and I spray it down. I'm like, yeah, but you just wash it off. Well, when they spray the plant and it rains, where do the insecticides and herbicides end up? In the soil, and then it goes up through the root and into the food. You can't just wash it off. That would be good. Oh, Derek Caroline is giving me the time. Right. <laughs> okay, I might just start flipping through slides. Uh, organic farming, no chemical fertilizers, compost, no pesticides, herbicides, hand weeding. So you're gonna pay more. Right? It's not as easy to grow organic food. I, I reckon if there was more demand, it would get cheaper and cheaper. There'd be more of it. And it would, yeah, there's ways around this, but we need to we need to get into it. A little comic relief here, if my video works.
You mean to tell me if I have insufficient nutrients, that could cause chronic illness? Get out of here. It took them until 2002 to figure this out. Right? Suboptimal levels of vitamins are risk factors for chronic disease such as cardiovascular disease, cancer, and osteoporosis. There you go. So nutrition is kind of important. Right? Conditions related to nutritional deficiencies, I assure you this is a very partial list. We won't sit there and read them all, and I'm running out of time, so we're going to zip. Anybody heard of this guy, Weston, Weston Price? So he was a uh, biological dentist in the 20s and 30s, and he was very interested in health, and he traveled all around the world, and he studied um, primitive cultures, you know, cultures that were removed from Western civilization. You know, they've never seen white sugar, they've never had a Coke, they've never been to a doctor. So your Aboriginals, your Inuits, your Eskimos, right? And of course, this was 90, 100 years ago, so there's a lot more of them then. And what he found was uh, they were all healthy. They didn't have cancer. They didn't have heart disease. As long as they didn't die from trauma, they lived, you know, 100 was like an average, right? So we hear that all the time. Well, we're living longer, so we're healthier. We're not. Oh, the average lifespan in the turn of the century was 47. And now we're, you know, the lifespan is 83. So we're living long. You know, the only difference is we had high infant mortality rates. Right? It's very, you know, to live like past five, that was like, whew, we made it. Right? So death at birth from the first year of life. So if someone lives to 100 and a baby dies at one, what's the average life expectancy? 50. That's how they come up with the numbers. We're not living any longer. Our genes haven't changed. Your genetic blueprint, the human genome is a human genome, right? We're programmed to live 80 to 120 years. The average is 100, right? So that's what he found was happening. They didn't have cavities, and they didn't even have Colgate or fluoride. <laughs> <laughs> right? So what did they have in common? Mineral-rich water supply. Cut off from foods of commerce, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds, a little bit of meat, fish, and raw dairy. That was what they had in common. Some of them more than others. You know, Eskimos were living off whale blubber. Guess how much heart disease they had? None. You guys with me? Whole grains, not like the stuff that we get now. It's all been hybridized and so on. People get that too. Well, Jesus ate bread. Not the bread you eat. <laughs> right? Yeah. So we we bought a house recently and the big selling point for me was that there's a well and it goes down 360 feet into the aquifer. So guess what I'm getting? Right out of the tap. Bathroom tap, kitchen tap. And I was like, yeah, who cares how many bedrooms it has, honey? It's got a well with spring water right in it. <laughs> right? So the supplementation, I get these questions, like what kind of supplements should I take? Now, let me pre preface with, let's assume you don't have any chronic illnesses or autoimmune you know, issues, because you might need some specialized nutritional recommendations. Okay, that's a whole, but for 80% of the room, and even the folks that are struggling with something, these are kind of commonplace. So where should you get your vitamins from? Whole food vitamins. So in other words, your centrum, right? No, it's all synthetic. It's man-made. It's made in the lab. You're just going right through it. If anything, it's hard on your kidneys, right? So you want your vitamins to come from your food, ideally. And you can get concentrated you know, greens, powders. They come from organic fruits and vegetables. They dehydrate it in very low temperature so it doesn't destroy the enzymes and the nutrients. And you just mix it in your water and boom, there you go. Right? Food. You can never go wrong with food. It's the way God made it, right? What plant did Centrum grow on? <laughs> it was made in a factory. Think about that, right? The food is made in a factory, but you don't want to eat it. Fish oil. How many of you in here are taking a high quality fish oil? Handful of you? Everybody should be taking fish oil. Right? High quality. Not the stuff you can buy in a tub for $10. That's yucky. I don't have time to explain, but. Don't chintz on your vitamins. If you're going to get them and you want quality, you're going to pay for them, okay? Uh, vitamin D. Anybody supplementing vitamin D? Cool. Research is out. Huge study. 1,200 participants. 
cancer reduction 60% in those who supplement vitamin D. 60%. That's better than any intervention that there ever was and probably ever will be. And that's just vitamin D supplementation. That's not all the other things you could be doing. Yeah, yeah, D3, and if and we've been conditioned to think that the sun is pure evil, you can go out in the sun for 20 minutes a day, right? Go out in your bikini, right? We're not talking about going out for five hours and getting cooked. That's not good for you. A bit of sun every day, right? You're lathering up with sunblock. By the way, what's in there? Chemicals and heavy metals. No, I know. Okay. And probiotics would be a good one. Now, you don't have to buy probiotics. You can fermented foods and sauerkraut and things like that that are loaded with the probiotics are the good bugs right and because again our modern day lifestyles and pollution we're kind of wiping out our good bacteria and I was told I forget his name already the doctor that's been speaking on Saturday mornings he's probably been talking about the gut brain axis and the importance for your immune system and again you got more uh, bacterial DNA in you than human DNA and so you want to have you want to feed the good bacteria okay that's the problem with processed food. It feeds the bad bacteria. All right, whole food versus synthetic. Best source of vitamins and minerals is your food, right? The majority of commercial vitamins are made up of synthetic, so you don't want synthetic stuff made in a lab, made in a factory. They don't perform the same. And a lot of them will actually deplete your body of other nutrients. So they tax your kidneys and they rob you of other essential nutrients that you're carrying, right? Because, you know, I kind of go back, as a, as a person of faith, I go back to, well, God made it, my body knows exactly what to do with it. But if man made it, well, in what proportion? And if it's synthetic, is it going to operate the same way in my body? It's kind of a guessing game, right? Uh, how much time do we have, Caroline? Should I skip this? It's a three minute. Yeah, what time are we supposed to be done? You're good. Okay, I'm skipping it. It's a little video. When I turned 50, I started to okay, lose gain minutes. weight. I got a very sore right hip, lower back pain, and I just wasn't doing very well health-wise. So I went on elimination protocol. I lost all the weight, all my aches and pains disappeared, unbelievable clarity of mind, and I found that the biggest problem of all was weight. Our weight has changed dramatically, um, so much so that it doesn't even resemble what it used to. We certainly have observed over time a steady increase in the rate of celiac disease and the rate of uh, non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Why? It's really interesting to see how many foods are now today being thought of as toxic or as not good for us. You know, for example, we no one's thinking about maybe there's something in the wheat now that they didn't used to be there that's causing this problem. Today they have methods where they start with the wheat and in two hours it's in the plastic bag as a loaf of bread. The wheat that has been developed now was developed for commercial reasons and of course it's laced with chemicals. We gorged ourselves on its availability once we were able to figure out how to grow it limitlessly. Wheat is in everything. It's in everything. Consumer people here do not believe everything we're told. Arthritis, vitiligo, alopecia, thyroiditis, they always find a connection between that autoimmune disease and gluten. If you don't think we're at a crisis, you're not watching, you're not looking, you're not talking to teachers, you're not listening to parents because we have an extreme health crisis in our children today. This is a very uh, difficult time for those who are more concerned about the truth and about what's best for our health versus you know, the powers that be that don't, don't want people to know the truth about we. Chemical fertilization leaves your foods and crops deficient in vital minerals, trace elements, micronutrients, because the soil is not getting those nutrients. Glyphosate is the active ingredient in the pervasive herbicide Roundup, which is used uh, in chemical agriculture extensively. We are 10 times more bacteria than we are human cells. Therefore, glyphosate becomes a major issue for us to be real concerned about. Every week, there's something published that adds to our understanding of the importance of these microbes. Imagine how many tens of millions of people are experiencing the same sort of issues and don't really know that it's as a result of 
food choices, but they assume that it's a natural artifact of getting older. The story of wheat is the story of food. Become educated, become knowledgeable, become aware, start making changes step by step, habit by habit, and we may be able to create a tsunami of change that will change the health of our children and future generations. You just can't continue to douse your food with neurotoxins and not expect it to show up in the human population. What did we just talk about earlier? The, the new normal while well, walking it. Well, that used to be the case. Now it's 18 months. Neurotoxins are not even developing, right? So we talked about glyphosate. Guess, guess who made that? Monsanto. Uh huh. <clears throat> okay. Highest number of vitamins and minerals are found in fresh fruit and vegetables. Buy organic. If you can get fresh and local, that's the best. And cook your food less. If you cook the crud out of it, you're destroying all the enzymes and many of the nutrients. Right? So um, eat raw. It's a good idea to have something raw in every meal. That's why salads are great. You know, just make a big, beautiful, healthy salad. It's raw. Um, but the less you cook things, your meats, you want to try to slow cook them. Slow cooking is really good. Right, rather than you know charring them on the grill. Oh, I know that's tasty and all, but, <clears throat> but so is slow cooking. All right, so we're gonna wind down. I probably got 10, 15 minutes. Is that okay? All right. Fast food hamburger photographed using Curlian photography. Three to seven megahertz of energy. So that's the energy given off by a fast food hamburger, and that's the energy given off by a <coughs> lentil sprout. So it's kind of like well. What do you think? Doctors, which one's going to do your body good? That or that? <laughs> right? You want to be powered up. Put some on your set. Freshness and nutritional value. So consider vegetables in your local grocery store. They may have already been picked two weeks ago. Um, they may have lost up to 75% of their nutritional value by the time you buy them. Right? So hence, you want to try to get local hasn't been on a truck for weeks, or gas, um, and obviously organic, because if, if it's not organic, just assume it's gonna have chemicals all over it. Yeah, but I saved two bucks. Well, that's not gonna do you good when you're sick. Do you trust the label? Okay. Yeah, it's gotta be certified. I mean, the best thing is obviously if you can grow your own, or if you know somebody who's got a local, you know, if you know your, your farmer, that would be ideal. But in the absence of that, certified organic should be the real deal. If it just says organic, like some guy on the corner, you don't know where there's a food source, I would question that. All right. uh, cooking and nutritional value. So we talked about broiling, boiling, grilling, and frying can destroy the vitamins and enzymes found in food. 118 degrees doesn't make it, that's not that hot. So that can destroy the enzymes and the enzymes are what are actually breaking your food down. So if you destroy the enzymes, your body has to make and produce the enzymes, which is very taxing on your system. It's very energy taxing for your body to try to produce the enzymes. So a lot of times we're having digestion because our body's just not able to keep up with producing the enzymes. So if you start eating more raw food or lightly steamed, things like that will help. You can also supplement with enzymes. Right, so if you're having digestive issues, if you like your steak, you might need to be, you know, taking like a hydrochloric acid 10 minutes before you eat. Or if you're having trouble breaking things down, you can take digestive enzymes with your meal. Okay, but ideally you just want to eat food that is, you know, cooked to death and still has enzymes in it. Right? You know, it's kind of like um, if you bought, if you have raw milk, it goes. It goes off eventually. Um, it actually never goes off. It's just kind of funky. It just changes. But it's got enzymes in it. It's alive. Right? Remember the longest lived, healthiest people? They had raw dairy. But we get pasteurized dairy, which means it's been cooked. So all the enzymes that are in it have been totally destroyed. So it's really a non food, which we're also raising our kids on, you know, for strong bones. The highest, the countries with the highest dairy consumption have the highest rates of osteoporosis, by the way. Nothing to do with milk. Where do cows get calcium? Grown cows aren't going around sucking on the teats of other cows, right? 
Why does a cow produce milk? For whom? A baby cat. Are we baby cats? Insert joke. No. Right? You guys with me? So who taught us that we need milk with every meal and every kid's got to have a glass with breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Who, who taught us that? The dairy industry. You got it right? Yeah. Uh, and the only reason it's pasteurized, I don't think raw milk, it's not an essential. I don't think it's the worst thing for you. But why is it pasteurized? Well, if you get raw milk, how long does it, you know, does it stay as milk and you'll be comfortable drinking? Yeah, week, 10 days, maybe two weeks. But if you buy pasteurized milk, it will sit in your fridge for four or six weeks. It's just shelf life. That's nothing to do with safety, right? All right, microwaving. Are we still using microwaves? Mm -hmm. Don't use your microwave. Destroys up to 94% of the antioxidants in your food. This is all the uh, scientific uh, journal, Science of Agriculture. So your blood, remember I talked about sticky blood? That's called rouleau. So if you're eating toxic food and you're dehydrated, your blood can get sticky. So it sticks together and it kind of looks like CDs, stick, like you know, like you're stacking CDs. Remember CDs? Mm -hmm. State of the art. Right, and here's healthy blood cells, right? They're all separated and free floating so they can fit through capillaries. But what happens when you gotta fit this clump through a capillary? Your blood pressure is gonna go up. Because that's what carries oxygen to your end organs. You need oxygen there. Or you're gonna, your organs are gonna die. And then when they die, what are they gonna do to you? Remove them. Oh, you're getting older, Bill. Okay, feeding rules, right? Some principles. So raw food, fiber first. So eat something raw, eat something that contains fiber, and eat that first. So if you're gonna have a salad with your dinner, fill up on that first, right? And then have the rest of your meal. So just start putting in good things first and add more raw food over time. If you're not used to it, you know, you might not enjoy it that much or it might be a little tough on you first, but you just start layering it in. Stay full root, full rule. You wanna eat enough food to stay full throughout the day. What happens when you go shopping hungry? Yeah. Bad choices, yeah. Yeah, right? You wanna be full so you're not just like, whatever. Just, I'll eat it, <laughs> you know? Uh, and the vacation rule. So three or four times a week, if you're not significantly overweight or have diabetes, you know, if you're, if you're battling with some illness, these rules may not apply. But you know, it's a Super Bowl. Have your chips and Doritos and your soda, whatever, right? It's not gonna, if you're doing things right and you're healthy and you're functioning well, you can handle these things here and there. Your body will know what to do with it, how to eliminate waste and so on. It's just when you constantly insult your body with things and not give it what it needs, so you're nutrient deficient. That with me, so you're deficient and toxic all the time. That leads to breakdown. Does that make sense? And again, I'm gonna have a handout for you. It's got some things, some takeaways for you, so you're not left going, what do you say? What do I eat again? <laughs> Try to, I keep it simple, that's another principle of mine. If it's all complicated and you gotta weigh your food and how many grains of rice can I have tonight, Sally, you're never gonna do it. You can't sit around and measure your food and go on some fad diet, or you can eat bacon all day on this diet. Well, how long are you gonna eat bacon? You know, it's gonna get old in a hurry. So it's gotta be lifestyle-based, right? This just becomes part of how you live and how you eat and how you do. Right? So there you go, the perfect un-diet. 80 to 90% of food, we just call it food by God. Food by nature, if that's your philosophy, that's fine, right? And you handle it 80, 90 percent of the time. Just put good stuff in the tank. And then the other time, it's your Super Bowl. It's whatever. It's a birthday party, and you're going to have cake and ice cream. You know, you with me? You can live with that. You don't have to be perfect. Uh, I don't claim to be. You know, people get a little nervous. Am I going to have to eat? You know, alfalfa and bark? <laughs> I'd rather be dead. You know, right? <laughs> no, you can. First of all, you can make healthy food tasty. You might have to learn some new tools and you know learn how to shop differently, but you can make really tasty, healthy food, and then you can still have your treats now and again, and it's gonna be okay, right? I mean, do I like pizza? I like all the same stuff you like. Yeah. It's like being human, chocolate, yeah, whatever. I just don't make a habit out of eating those things all day, every day. So, I'm gonna change gears a little bit. 
Uh, these are things that are grossly overlooked, um, so I'm going to touch on it before I run out the door here tonight. There's 10 systems of the body, right? I'm sure you guys already knew which 10 they were, but just in case, there they are. Cardiovascular, lymphatic, skeletal, respiratory, endocrine, urinary, digestive, talking nutrition, reproductive, muscular, and then there's one other one that controls all the other systems. So what one system controls all the other systems? The brain. Who said that? Hey! Yeah. And the brain is part of what system? Nervous system. Nervous system. Okay. So if your nervous system, and everybody knows that, by the way, that's on page four of Grey's Anatomy textbook. <laughs> Your brain, your central nervous system controls every organ tissue cell in your body. That's non-controversial, as I said, page four. So if your nervous system controls everything, what one system should you be most concerned with taking care of? Mm -hmm. Reproductive. <laughs> yes. Which also means you need a healthy nervous system. <laughs> All leave it alone. Okay. So it's your nervous system. Gold star for those who said brain and nervous system. So remind me, gang, if your brain were to stop working, what would happen to all your parts, including your reproductive system? <laughs> it's gone. It's dead. So you can your heart can stop and they can hook you up to a machine to pump your blood for you. True or true. You can stop breathing. We can hook you up to a machine to breathe for you. True or true. Your brain stops what can we hook you up to? That's when you're clinically dead. You have no more, there's not there's no light, there's no electrical chemical pulse. You guys with me? Yeah. So the brain the brain's kind of like the powerhouse, you know, like the power plant. And then you got those those big, you know, power lines that lead the power plant, right? And then when we get into the suburbs, it splits off the smaller power lines and goes to the homes. All right, what happens when a tree branch falls on the power line outside your house? Off goes your power. But was there a problem with the power plant? No, there's still power coming. It's just disconnected from your parts. Who's with me so far? Yeah. Okay. Like if I come along and I cut the nerve going to your heart, what happens to it? It stops. So what's the hierarchy? The heart or the nerve going to it? Nerve going to it. So raise your hand, last time you had a physical at your doctor's office, and they said, hey, your central nervous system controls and coordinates everything. Let's make sure that's healthy. Raise your hand if that happened. <laughs> we got one in the back, that's awesome. Right? Like they'll check your, they'll check, say, your vitals. Let's see what your pulse is doing. What controls that? Your nervous system. Let's check your blood pressure. What controls that? Your nervous system. Let's see what's floating around in your blood, your lipid profile, blah, blah, blah. What controls everything that's put in your blood? Your nervous system. And your body's chemistry, right? What controls your chemistry? Nervous system. <laughs> yeah, so I'm gonna reverse engineer. Your glands. Your glands, your endocrine system, right? But what controls those glands? Your nervous system. You guys with me? Mm -hmm. So everything goes back to here. Now, I'm a chiropractor. What houses your nervous system? Your spine. So this isn't about back pain, headaches, neck pain, although everybody knows chiropractic can help that. What I wish more people understood was a back problem, if you've got damaged spine, misalignments, that's not a back problem. That's a health problem. Because all the breast nutrition in the world isn't going to fix an interference from the nerve to the end tissue. Right? No vitamin is going to fix. If I put pressure here, we're getting less life to the heart or to the bowel or to your endocrine glands. There is no diet that's going to fix that. There's no pill that's going to fix that. The only thing to fix is to remove the interference. That's what chiropractic is. So for those of you, I'll thank you in advance. If you actually took the time to look, at least look at it, you didn't have to fill it up, but you just kind of looked at it and you go, uh huh, we have a bit of that, maybe a little bit of that, or I have that. I think I'm having that. I'll take the ones I don't have. <laughs> so what are these things? So they are the most common things people tend to complain of. I got digestive complaints, you know, my balance is a bit off, fatigue, headaches, back pain. Are those common? Super common. What if those were the first symptoms 
first time your body's trying to tell you we're in a state of breakdown. But we just go, eh, it's normal, everybody gets back pain and headaches. Time all, I can throw it. But what's your body trying to tell you? What if that's the alarm? We're going the wrong way. Okay? So those are the most common things we see in our office, but then when we start evaluating people, and I go, you feel how it's sore right there between the shoulders? Yeah. Do you notice you get bloating after meals? Yeah, how did you know? Well, I'm a real genius. I just trace the anatomical chart. Right? So in our office, we actually specialize, I kind of have a specialty, uh, extra training. I, I practice a technique that's up for cervical called Blair. And this isn't a chiropractic talk, but I think it's really important because at the end of the day, nutrition's not even what it's about. It's about being healthy. Right? So I practice an art that's 0.3%, and that's being nice, 0.3% of all chiropractors on the planet practice. And that is specifically analyzing this area. Why would we want to pay particular attention to this area of the spine? What's up there? Brain. Well, you've heard of a brain stem. That's the main breaker. You know, you got your fuse box, you turn off the fridge, the air conditioner, the lights in the kitchen. What happens when you hit the main one? Everything's off. That's what happens up here. And in order to detect it and analyze, you have to test special imaging, special angles, and special training to even find it. So that's what we do in our office. And what we found is when this is misaligned, you got a two ounce bone sitting underneath a 10 pound head, right? If you've ever had a fall, uh, the average toddler falls 39 times a day. If you fall on your tailbone, Mm -hmm. Right, there's locking mechanisms all the way up your spine. It's designed to be strong, but those locking mechanisms don't exist up here because you need to be able to move. So you can fall on your bum, and it's going to send shock all the way up, and then kick that out. And no one ever looks there. Well, my back hurts, and I fell on it, but that gets locked there. And as the years go by, everything below them compensates. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if you've never had that checked. I would recommend you do so. It doesn't have to be in my office. I can't see everybody anyway. But I think it's really important. So I think everybody should have a good chiropractor on their healthcare team, just like you should have a good, say, naturopath, so they can analyze what's going on. Are you toxic with something, deficient in something? Everybody with me? Someone that can kind of guide you along that way. So one of the reasons my kids, to this day, haven't had one round of antibiotics or Tylenol is because we've been making sure that that's been healthy since day one. And 80 to 90% of the time, we put good food in their body and we just live by these principles. Does that make sense? Because mm -hmm. it's pretty smart. Like everything you need in there is there. It's pretty cool. How many of you know that your heart was beating since you've been sitting here? Or were you thinking about it? Beat, beat, beat. It's doing it, you don't think about it. And if you ate dinner before you came, you're digesting the simulated food. You don't even think about it. That's all your nervous system. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, so there you go. I think there's like 14,000 miles of nerves through your body. There's a few. All right, so I always like to ask, how's your nervous system functioning and how would you know? I think it feels pretty good. Now we're back to feel, feel good. Is that a good indicator of health? So if you don't feel good, if you have symptoms, I'm gonna tell you you've got red flags already. Those are the first indicators. You don't have a heart attack, you start here. Does that, does that make sense? Your body's trying to tell you. So that's what symptoms are. Your body's trying to tell you you're going the wrong way. And we can try to cover it up with pills, but we all know where that goes in the long run. All right, three reasons we're in a health crisis. Remember that, I told you I'd get back to that. Number one, personal responsibility. Number two, wrong definition of health. Number three, that, not this group. I'm just talking about out there. <laughs> Nobody in here. You know, I'll get around to it. Right? I'm guilty of it. I'll, I'll, yeah, I know. I got all this. I got some stuff. I'll get this done, and then I'll come back to it. You don't come back to it. Right? And when do we take action generally? When I say we, you know what I mean. Society. When do we take action? Crisis. So I would encourage you to take action before crisis. A, you're going to get better results. And B, life's just going to be better. Okay? So when's the best time to deal with your health? When's the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago, when's the next best time? Today, right? There's no accident. The reason she can do that is because she never stopped doing it. 
right? So some of you are like, well, yeah, when I was 40, I could do 100 push-ups. Well, how many can you do now? Maybe one. But what if you kept doing 100 push-ups and never stopped? What would you be able to do today? 100 push-ups. So what I'd like to do for you guys, for those of you who are interested, um, there's no obligation, there's no cost. Price is right. <laughs> um, a lot of folks have never had, I know most of you are over 30. I kid, I joke. Uh, a lot of folks have never had a proper analysis. Maybe you've been to chiropractic before. They just throw you on a table and do what they do, but you've never actually been properly analyzed from a neurostructural standpoint. And therefore, if you never been analyzed, you don't know if there's an interference in there. So what I'd like to do, and what I'd like to do for you guys, if you're interested, is we do an initial consult health history and a preliminary evaluation to see, do you likely have issues here that we might be able to help with? All right? There's no opportunity, there's no obligation, it's just an opportunity. If I can't help people, I tell them. I don't think I can help you, or it's not in my wheelhouse. If I can't help you, we'll say, here's what I found, here's what I think we can help. And then if you choose, we can do a deeper dive. So in our office, we use 3D CAT scans. You know, there's no guessing. It's like, if it's there, we're going to find it, and then we know exactly how to fix it. All right? Complimentary. I like to say participation is transformation. Who's the person that gets results? The person that talks about going to the gym or the one that goes? Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, I only have one caveat, and that is um, we're a busy, growing practice. Um, if you feel like, hey, maybe I do have an issue, and maybe your body is innately telling you, or you picked off some things on the thing, feel free to make an appointment. So there's two reasons people don't come to my office. Number one, time. You guys have extra time. And what's number two? Too far. Time and money. So <laughs> what, what I endeavor to do is eliminate both of those. Like, right? So we have set aside appointment times for those of you who are interested. Um, talk to Carolina before you run out the door. You also have handouts. Um, but the caveat is, don't put your name down. You know, we've got X amount of appointments. That's it. So if your name goes there and you don't really care, that means someone else's name can't go there. And someone's gonna call my office tomorrow who's sick and suffering and won't, might not get an appointment because you just put your name down. That being said, we'd love to have you get checked if you would like to, but just, you know, if it's a priority for you. If it's not, we love you just the same. Um, that's okay. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? So Caroline is the beautiful lady in the glasses in the back, next to the beautiful young girls there. And if you have questions, she's actually very intelligent, and she's really switched on with nutrition too. I would argue more so than me. Um, she just doesn't like to get up and talk in front of people. Weird, right? <laughs> okay, I think I'm done. Let me say thank you and God bless. And if you have questions, does anybody have any questions that might be group relevant? And if you have more one-on-one -on -one questions, I'll hang out for a little bit. Anybody, group question? Fish oil. Uh, the criteria is small fish from cold water. So like your sardines, your anchovies are like kind of off Norway and up that way. That's number one. Number two is it needs to be molecularly distilled. I don't, don't ask me how to spell it. Molecularly distilled. Krill, I'm a little, uh, I'm on the fence about that one. Um, only because I just go back to my principle, because that's a good question. Like, well, they say it's better, and it's got 10 times more this and that. I would say our human, I'll ask it in the form of a question. So if you didn't hear his question, he said, what about krill? Who's sort of krill oil have in the central fat acids, right? Um, so when I, when I was reading this, I thought to myself, did God create us to eat krill? No, it doesn't fit into my, my foundational principles, so I'm just gonna go official because I know we were designed to eat fish. Does that make sense? I could be wrong, but that's my two cents. Um, and I don't know how they process the, the krill oil to get it the krill into a bottle. But molecularly distilled fish oil. And you know, if you've ever had fish oil and it repeats on you, you know what I'm talking about? It's disgusting, like you burn, but it tastes like fish. You don't want that, trust me. Uh, and that is an indicator that it's poor quality. You shouldn't, you should have very little taste and it shouldn't be repeating on you like that. So molecularly distilled. Uh, I have a brand I'll recommend, you can get it on Amazon. It's called Innate Choice, I-N-N-A-T-E, 
choice. It's not the only one out there, but it's what my family and I take. And you can even get it infused with vitamin D. So it's got your vitamin D right in it. Two birds. Any other questions? Yes, sir? Uh, D3 and K2. Yes. Should they be together? Should we take them together? Great question. I believe so, and I believe that's more uh, important. Uh, K2, uh, vitamin K with your uh, with your vitamin D. The answer is yes, particularly as you get older. So you're 65, 70, 75. That's a great question. Yes, you can take them together. Then you can probably take them separately, but yeah. But the company you get, do they, they have the full range of vitamins and minerals, or just fish oil? Yeah, they have fish oil. They have probiotics, um, and they have the greens. So. Yeah, it kind of gets a little technical um, because you could you could argue a case for lots of different vitamins and supplements, but the ones that you can apply ubiquitously to the human genome that were always seem to be deficient in is your omega-3 fatty acids, which is your fish oil, your vitamin D, and your probiotics. And probably enzymes and vitamins and minerals is where you get your, you're going to get from your greens, like your top green powder and stuff, if you're not getting it from your food. I don't I don't know. My guess is most berries have high concentrations of antioxidants, so it's probably marketed as you know, a lot of antioxidants good for your immune system, keep you youthful, etc. How about magnesium? Magnesium. Uh, I would say that's more important than calcium because they're telling you, oh, you got that strong bone, take the calcium. Um, the problem isn't that we're not getting enough calcium. The problem is our body's not metabolizing it properly and holding on to it. So if you're eating an acidic diet, which by the way, dairy is acidic. So if you're acidic, your body can't survive an acid. So it's going to have to get some minerals into your blood to bring you more down to alkaline, right? So what is the... What is is good? Yeah, magnesium is good. So if you're acidic, your body will pull minerals out of your bones to neutralize the acid. Right. And milk is acidic. Follow that line of thinking there. But anyway, any other questions? I saw a hand over there. Yeah. My doctor said don't eat much cheese. Uh, you know, just in a general sense, most cheeses are pretty highly processed. I think there's exceptions. I think a little bit of cheese isn't going to kill you. But again, I don't know your health history and condition. I would say you probably don't want to eat a ton of cheese just in general, but I think a little bit of brie on the weekend won't kill you. I like brie. But just like a lot of things, some of them are very minimally processed, and if you can get stuff that uh, has been pasteurized and cooked to death and have added aluminum like cheddar, often the hard cheeses can have metals added to it, so soft cheeses are healthier. Hence I mentioned brie. Uh, goat cheeses are less offensive as well, your fetas and your goat cheeses and things. Who likes cheese? Your guys are getting hungry now. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Um, so what's the reason to eat sauerkraut? Oh, it's a great natural source of uh, healthy bacteria. So if you don't want to spend the money on probiotics, you can eat fermented foods. So like your kimchi, sauerkraut. So do you buy it already processed? Uh, you can buy it organic. You can make your own if you're so inclined. It's pretty, pretty easy. It's got to be raw. Yeah, raw. Yeah, you want raw. But you can buy like jars of raw, organic sauerkraut. And you don't need a lot. You can just eat, you know, in fact, if you just have a, a spoonful or two of every meal, you're going to get a huge dose of um, healthy probiotic, healthy bacteria. Uh, How about the uh, probiotic? Uh, probiotic yogurt? You'd have to eat like four gallons of yogurt to get the. <laughs> yeah, just have a spoonful of sauerkraut. Yeah. It's just a, I think it's a marketing tactic. Oh, it's got good probiotics in it, but you'd have to eat a truckload of it. Unless it's made from raw milk. Yeah, or which. Made with pasteurized dairy. Yeah. It's hard. Like, we were in Australia for 11 years, so we could get stuff that we can't get here, which is a bit frustrating. There's a lot of local green grocers and local farmers. You can get this local stuff. So you can get raw milk and 
Oh, uh, there you go. So there's a farmer's market there? Yeah. yeah. And is that open to everybody? Yeah. Okay. There you go. So I don't know if everybody heard that. You can get good raw stuff at the Brownwood Market? Yes, Saturday that, morning. Okay, good to know. Thank you very much. Saturday morning, Brownwood. Raw milk, cheese, goat. Cool. There you go. Yeah. No worries. Thank you for coming. I'll stop talking. If you have more questions, just, just come on up. Thank you for your time, Dave Brandon, for